It's my pleasure to welcome Ryan Kinzer of Northeastern University, who will speak to us today about module varieties with dense orbits in every component. Well, thanks for having me. I'm happy to speak. Uh, make this talk as self-contained as possible. Um, first of all, when I talk about a field, I always want to work with an algebraically closed field. And we're going to talk about algebras, but there's many of these come in many uh, varieties. Whenever I say algebra, this is always an associative algebra over this algebraically closed field. And in particular, I want it to be finite dimensional, just as a vector space. So there's some sense like quite small. Um, and we're even interested in very certain kinds of algebras, which are those presented by equivers with relations. So. I'll give a couple examples. So we usually call <coughs> our quiver Q. Well, I should mention a quiver is just a fancy name for a directed graph. And relations I. In fact, it's an ideal of relations. Okay, so how do we get an algebra out of a directed graph? Well, there's like a nice visual way to do it. So, um, start out with a path algebra of Q. This is just a finite dimensional vector space with basis all the paths in Q. And multiplication is just concatenation of paths whenever that makes sense, and zero when it doesn't. So I'll do a couple examples here, let's see what this is. So if we take like a nice small directed graph, with uh, three vertices, two arrows, and then have them go like alpha, beta, then KQ has, well, it's a six dimensional vector space because my paths are I could start here and do nothing. Another path is I could start here and do nothing, or I could start here and go over, it's three. Or I could start here and do nothing, I could start here and go here, or I could start here and go all the way over here. So uh, KQ is then isomorphic. Well, if you think about it, it's actually kind of a well-known finite dimensional algebra. This is just isomorphic to the upper triangular 3 by 3 matrices. And uh, we can kind of fancy this up by adding some relations on it. An ideal of relations is just you just specify some relations among the paths. Like the simplest thing you can do here is you could say that, let's say when I compose these two alpha beta, instead of being the long path alpha beta, I set that equal to zero. And so in particular, notice, I guess I should say, this is a, not usually commutative because if I try to multiply beta and alpha in the correct order in this original setup, that gives me the full path where I go through both of them. If I try to multiply them in the wrong order, then I get zero because they don't concatenate in the other direction. And so you can set an ideal relations. So you get something like here when I multiply those two together, alpha and beta would correspond to that, so I'd be like killing that entry. Our directed graphs are allowed to have multiple edges. I mean it in the most general sense. Uh, they're allowed to have loops, anything you want. So another example would be um, something like Q is just a single vertex with two loops at it. And KQ in this case would be free algebra on two generators. <coughs> 
because I'm basically allowed to go around this thing any way I want. Any, any word in X's and Y's is going to be a path in this, and then the order does matter to give you different paths. And then if you take some sort of ideal, like I could declare something like the path where I go around X then Y minus the path where I go around Y then X, just declare that zero, and you could maybe say um, some powers are these, of these are also zero to make it finite dimensional. I guess this is not finite dimensional. If I put an idea like this, it's finite dimensional and this is some familiar object. Well, we forced the x and y to commute, so now it's a regular old polynomial ring, modulo nilpotence on these. Right, so that's two basic examples of algebras you can get presented with the quiver of the relations. So it somehow seems a little more concrete in some sense. You're, vi you're taking a uh, finite dimensional algebra and you're really able to visualize it by seeing the generators and uh, how the generators multiply together in a visual way rather than in formulas. Um, so it might seem like it's a very special thing, but in fact this is actually, in, well, if you're a representation theorist, then this is the general case. Um, for any algebra A, again, just to reemphasize it one more time, associative finite dimensional over an algebraically closed field, there exists a quiver with relations qi such that you can't quite say that a is isomorphic to kq mod i but up to more <coughs> with their isomorphic up to morita equivalents so in other words the modules over a are isomorphic to the mo uh, the category of modules over a is equivalent to the category of modules over kq mod i so if you're a representation theorist and you just care about the representations rather than the intrinsic object itself you can consider any algebra you want to study to be given in this way uh, okay, so the next step, kind of last piece of the puzzle in the background is uh, a geometric way to study these representations through so-called module varieties. And again, the nice thing about the quiver with relation setups, you can really like see this in some concrete matrix terms. So what's the setup? It's like you're given a dimension vector. A dimension vector, let me run in, run in these examples, um, would be something like a choice of numbers. Oops. So like in our first example, just a choice of dimension of vector spaces at each vertex. In the second example, there's only one vertex, so you just have... Yeah. If you think about it, what is it to give a representation of this algebra on a vector space, you need to say some action of the generators. And since it's a finite dimensional vector space, that action can be described by matrices. So the modules, um, which have this dimension vector as, some, as their discrete data, can just be described by choices of matrices over the arrows. So we get a module variety. So instead of writing this out in like some, some fancy notation, everything, I'll just basically give two examples and do definition by example. So in the first case, um, we have the, the module variety mod AD would be collection of pairs of matrices A and B. And then such that, oh, I should say what A is. In these cases, like, A is KQ mod I here. Um, but they can't just be any pairs of matrices. We have this ideal of relations that said their product had to be zero, so you would Im impose those, that condition on there, such that AB equals zero. So maybe even like more concretely, if D equals Two, two, two. Uh, mod A D equals pairs of matrices A one, A two, A three, A four, B one, B two, B three, B four. 
subject to the four equations Uh, setting the entries of a, b equal to zero. Clear enough, so you really have like spec of that polynomial ring with eight variables, modulo the four, equa four quadratic equations you get when you multiply those two matrices out would be the modulo variety. And in the second case, they won't like write it out with all the actual vari variables for the entries, but you, would, you could describe it as we have some vector space, we have a pair of endomorphisms, x and y, and so the associated module variety here, we could say something like x, y is a pair of uh, commuting nilpotent matrices. Of the exact degrees M and N. Okay, so one thing to notice is as varieties, these are, can be complicated, but in the simplest case, if I is equal to zero, then, well, if I is equal to zero, you're just looking at the space of matrix, ways to put matrices over the, all the arrows subject to no conditions. So it's not very interesting, it's just a big affine space. And so that's not the, the case that we really want to. Interested in long term, but you can make this interesting by considering the uh, change of basis. So these varieties, the action of, well, they have an action of GLD on them. Again, I'll do a quick example, and the upshot of this is going to be um, that the orbits of this action are in bijection with the isomorphism classes of A modules. GLD means yeah, let me draw a picture. A product of GLNs. Yeah, that's exactly right. Let me draw the picture again. So what is this saying? This is saying like if I want to look at uh, the module variety associated with this, say with AB equal to zero, well, this is like when I choose specific matrices, that's not, not like the only way you could write down this action uh, of these arrows on these vector spaces. You could choose a different basis. So we have like GLK2 acting here, GLK3 acting here, GLK2 acting here. And uh, they act on these matrices in the left and right with the appropriate inverses. And, and if, yeah, you just go to the definitions, it's not like anything deep, is that the orbits of this, un, in this variety under this group are in bijection with ISO classes of modules. Um, and in fact, I think one kind of neat fact, we don't use it today, but I think one kind of nice fact is that uh, there's this Bongard's geometric Morita theorem which says that actually if you just have all these module varieties with their associated GLD um, structure, you can recover the algebra up to isomorphism. So although these, these varieties just parametrize modules and you feel like somehow you've lost the morphisms in the category, the GLD structure allows you to recover the isomorphism class of the algebra and you really have all the, the data of the algebra in there. Um, well, and so there's classical results. I'll just say, uh, oops, sorry, from classical results on the I equals zero case. So even the I equals zero case is now interesting once you construct, once you consider the GLD action, you have uh, you know reductive group acting on vector space, many classical questions. Um, a little theorem, wouldn't even be sure to, who to attribute it to, maybe many people. And it says that uh, this path algebra, when I don't have any relations, it has finitely many indecomposables. 
if and only if for all D um, the associated module variety has a dense orbit. So you can characterize what's a purely representation theoretic property having only finitely many isomorphism classes of indecomposable representations in this purely geometric way saying that you always get a dense orbit. Uh, well, look, a question naturally comes up. This question originally asked by Yerzy Veyman. What happens when i is not equal to zero? Can we naturally generalize this? Because the i equals zero case is, is, it is quite special. It's, uh, if you want to, what is this in purely representation or purely algebraic terms? i equals zero is when the algebra has global dimension one. Every module has a short, um, you know, projective resolution by a short exact sequence. And when you start adding relations, the global dimension always goes up. So it's, it's much more general. Um, that's our main question. What if i is not equal to zero? Uh, well, already one thing really complicated happens. Last time we had a very nice variety, just a vector space. And uh, one bad thing that immediately kind of makes it hard to even say where to go is that this can be much more complicated. So the question itself actually doesn't, doesn't just naively carry over, because this can even have uh, many irreducible components. And so you can't hope for a dense orbit, because you have a bunch of different irreducible components. You can have many irreducible components, maybe again as a side remark, uh, even in special cases like where A is a so-called pre-projective algebra associated to a dink and quiver, the irreducible components are um, in bijection with a can semi-canonical basis of, of Lustig for the associated um, universal envelope and being algebra. So they kind of like, they can be complicated in other words. You can have like lots of irreducible components and you can have like, uh, you know, they have been studied and only like actually been enumerated in some very simple, special, not simple, but I should say very special cases where people really worked to understand these irreducible components. Um, but there is kind of a natural way to generalize the question at least. Uh, we're going to say that an algebra A has the dense orbit property. Well, we don't require the whole module variety to have a dense orbit, just every one of its irreducible components. Okay, so then there's one simple implication. Well, the, we want to generalize this now and say, does, with this in mind, does this generalize? Can you say that you only have finitely many in, in decomposable representations if and only if it has this dense orbit property? One, one direction is immediate just by constructability of orbits. Uh, is it representation finite? That's, that's the short term for having only finitely many in decomposable reps. Well, just by dimension count, the orbits are constructible. So, like, if you only have finitely many in any given dimension, uh, one of them has to has to uh, fill up the whole and be dense in an irreducible component. Um, the converse is the the converse is the interesting part. So, I have to be careful where I write this next part because I'm going to leave it up for the rest of the talk. Let's put it uh, right over here. All right, so we know that representation finite um, implies, I'm going to write it this way, dense orbit. And we want to know, can we go back this way? 
is converse true. So that brings us to what is going to, oh, to spoil some of the surprise, end up being sort of a detour, um, which I'll call MF algebras. Well, the problem is when you look at this and you start trying to prove the converse, what do you do with this dense orbit property? It's like not clear at all what you can, you can get from this. How do, you, how do you use this purely geometric assumption that there's really no results or background or anything known about uh, to prove something that's purely representation theoretic? You have finitely many orbits, finitely many indecomposables. Um, well, what we're going to do is, first of all, I need to say that characteristic of k should equal zero in this section. And with that in mind, we're going to try to use invariant theory as kind of the, the middleman. Um, and let me just, I have to make one or two definitions so this, so this is somewhat self-contained. Explain what these MF, algebra, uh, MF algebras are. So instead of letting the whole GLD act by base change, we can just let SLD, and here I mean... Uh, determine at one matrices act at every, at every vertex. And let's just have it act on one component. And when we do this, well, we're going to get a decomposition of the coordinate ring by characters of GLD. So this decomposes the coordinate ring. When we take the invariance, we look at the regular functions on this uh, irreducible component, which are invariant under SLD. This decomposes it into a sum of weight spaces. Call theta, where theta is uh, characters of GLN. And when you do this, well, sometimes in some certain cases, which I'll say what the certain cases are, I would say what's like a nice situation, which will give it a definition, is say that A is multiplicity free. Which we'll abbreviate by MF if um, all of these weight spaces are just one-dimensional vector spaces, or zero if there's no semi-invariance of that particular weight. And so, yeah, that's called, that's called multiplicity-free. And when I say all, I really mean like all components for all dimension vectors and for all weights. Uh, well, why would, okay, why would we do such a thing? Well, we have a nice connection that ended up, you know, it's just a possibility to prove our, our original conjecture, our converse that we wanted to go back from dense orbits to representation finite, which I'll write it as a, a lemma. I said this DO property, if an algebra has a dense orbit property, then it also has the, multipl the multiplicity free property. So I'm going to add this to our... In order to keep track of this throughout the talk, I'll add it up here. So we have dense orbit property, we have multiplicity free. In order to try to now go back and get our converse, then instead of studying this connection, we can try to like fill this, fill this part in. We're left with that. Well, why would we think that would be an improvement? That's a fair question to ask. Have we just like made just change the question around. Um, there is a lot known about, about the connection between multiplicity of weight spaces and the representation type. There's already some established tools to use going back to uh, um, Sato and Kimura and uh, Skowronski and Veyman. Uh, 
and a number of a number of results that tell you like tra translate from properties of the simian variance weight spaces to properties of your algebra. Like the simplest one, maybe just to put one up there, is that uh, note that when i is equal to zero, again our kind of guiding case, uh, the multiplicity free property is equivalent to the rep finite property. And then hence also equivalent to DO. So in the I equals zero case, all these properties end up being the same thing. And so that's the, the, at least the motivation to try to use it in the general case. Um, and like I said, we want to know, does multiplicity free then imply uh, representation finite in general? So this is our attempt at a detour, kind of indirect attack on the problem. Unfortunately, oh wait, let me, before I get to the unfortunately part, let me <laughs> mislead you a little bit. Uh, we're, again, besides the I equals zero case, okay, so also, you know, how do you start to try to prove a conjecture? You take some specific classes of algebras where you have more explicit tools, where you have more things to know about it, known about it. And I'll say like one, one class is when the algebra A has a uh, pre-projective component. I'm going to put it in quotes so that I don't have to define it. Okay, if you don't know what this means, just say in some, you can replace this with in some special class of algebras. In this case, yes, uh, all these things end up being equivalent. We thought, okay, now we just have to remove that hypothesis and then we'll uh, figure out how it works in general. But now we get to the unfortunately part. Uh, we found a counterexample. In some, in some bad cases, this doesn't always work. There's something special about algebras where these things are equivalent. Um, so let's say. In general, multiplicity free does not imply finite. Let me give you the specific example. And well, by bringing up a technique that didn't work to prove the thing we wanted to prove. Well, the, what I think is cool is it seems to open up uh, some other class of algebras to look at. I'll say a little, a little more about that. First, let me give you an example. Um, this was uh, from Veyman, and it appears in our joint paper with Colleen Kindris. Um, which I should have said at the very, very beginning, I suppose. Um, so let me write this over here for the rest of the talk. Maybe I should save this question for the end, but was it conjecture they were the same, or was it just hope that it implied? Um, I don't know the... <laughs> Yeah. Said it was truth. Okay. Yeah. So Vagman was surveying people for I don't know five or ten years or something about this, and he was getting fifty percent you know, fifty percent yes. So we should try to prove one way or the other. Counterexample: the main result of the paper. Not this one. <laughs> I'm still leaving you hanging on whether. Uh, yeah, a counterexample can be a whole result, and there, yeah, it should have been. Yeah, well, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, the point was that it was something was after asking around, people were really divided. And this at some point said, okay, if, if, there's, if it's that unclear, we have to actually, like, really solve this. Um, and so let me just quickly get I get it because it's a nice little picture here. So you're, the quiver here, we call it the butterfly quiver. <laughs> and uh, you need to take some ideal of relations. And this is that all paths of length 2. equals zero. So if I go through, in other words, if I go through the middle and come out the other end, I have to set that path equal to zero. This is representation infinite. It's a so-called string algebra, but it's multiplicity free. And this is, um, uh, you can do, well, there's several ways. You can do it by direct computation. That was the first way it's done. Um, is it relatively 
Yeah, I, guess I would say so. Um, we had, there were several like, well, I, the way, the way um, Veyman originally showed it to me, no, it was, I thought it was quite, it seemed like a tough computation to me. And then, you know, as you digest it more, uh, Colleen and Kinders had some, some way to reduce it to like a smaller number of computations and, and then give kind of a, reduce it to one simpler computation. So. My question is near infinite. Um, Please. So is there, was there like a method for producing a counterexample or was it hit and miss or did you? One things we, some things we were doing were to literally just well because we proved it in like these, these certain classes so we tried to find like okay in some nice classes that were well understood there we, we could show that there wouldn't be any counterexamples the properties were equivalent right. so we started to try to take more obscure things it turns out this is not this is not what I would call obscure at all these string algebras are well understood and there's a lot known about them it's just no one really considered much about their uh, specifics about their semi invariance until until we saw this. Um, yeah, and so, so algebras are kind of well suited to say calculate some environment. There's sort of like I would say something like the toric varieties of finite dimensional algebras. You can really like get right down and draw pictures and get hands on with So with it was everything. looking under the under the light instead of in the dark alleyway. Yeah, basically it was uh, <laughs> yeah. so uh, let's see. And so okay, so we have this one example. Um, but kind of let me just without being so precise, I'll say what what happens here is um, and all the places you would look to try to, to, try to get, um, so this is multiplicity free, but all the places you would look to, to, to think that it wasn't multiplicity free, something special happens is you get representations, um, all the representations that fall into one parameter families that would make you think you would get multiplicity of weight spaces end up having a nilpotent endomorphism, which is kind of special. Um, and the things we're used to, like representations of semi-simple Lie algebras and something, all, are, all your indecomposables are really irreducible, and their endomorphism rings are trivial. You only have scalar endomorphisms for like uh, GLN modules, uh, SLN modules, and such. But this doesn't happen here. You have like big families of indecomposable as no potents, and so we, this ended up being worth uh, giving it a name. Um, turned out it already existed in the literature, but I'll say it up here. We call a represent Call an algebra sure rep finite if in any given dimension only finitely many representations have uh, scalar endomorphism ring. And this is kind of special. Usually like if you, if you take most string algebras or something, you'll have big families of algebras that all have trivial endomorphism ring. This one, like every time you have a family of representations in a given dimension, uh, they all have nilpotent endomorphisms. They have bigger endomorphism rings. And it turns out just by kind of playing with some similar examples and stuff, we were able to proved the following results. So this multiplicity free thing didn't end up being equivalent to dense orbits, which we were interested in, but what did it does end up being equivalent in one case, so we'll see if the place we can prove it, is um, for tame algebras, without giving a full algebra, of, yeah, let me say what tame is in a second, a tame uh, mf is equivalent to sure rep finite. So this is the reason why uh, present a method that didn't work because the thing we thought it would be equivalent to was not true. But we were able in another and we were able to like slightly instead of having only finitely many indecomposable representation, it has only finitely many with this additional property. Um, so ended up kind of having some interesting representation theoretic interpretation of multiplicity free for tame algebras. Um, for general algebras, we don't know, so we pose this as a conjecture. We were just, again, it's a special, K-algebras are ones where you really, you have a lot more tools available. All the indecomposables um, only fall into at most one parameter families. And there's, like I said, like many tools available. Uh, so it's not that we have a counterexample in general, it's just that we just don't want to prove it. I pose it as a conjecture now. Um, a is sure rep finite, if and only if A is multiplicity free. 
and actually ended up, uh, it's not so, not so difficult, but not entirely trivial to show that one half of this is, is always true, so there's only one left to prove this is always true. For sure representation finite, uh, it is always multiplicity free. You can prove it through some interpreting these, these rings of semi invariance as giving some like moduli of polystable representations. So did you want to stick sure rep finite over there in your diagram? Uh, no, because uh, this was like, this was kind of a detour. Because oh, okay. um, we don't have any conjectural connection between DO, our original, dense orbits, our original thing. Uh, but thank you for asking. So this ends up being a self-contained thing. This first attempt at proving it failed, but ended up being interesting in its own right. And as we kind of looked into it, it turns out the sure representation finite is already in the literature and being been explored for other reasons, things I don't know too much about. So coming back here, I can then put a big X through this in general. But remember, what were we trying to do? We were just trying to get a converse to this. And so, well, all this says is that this method of proving it doesn't work. It doesn't say that we doesn't say that they're not equivalent. It just says that our way of proving it is not going to work. So let's go back to the kind of the main event. Which is the DO property. And uh, our original question again is this finite representation type to have a purely geometric characterization as um, this dense orbit property? And well, the answer ended up being no. And our th theorem on this is make it a little more room. There exists uh, DO algebras of infinite representation type even wild type. So wild type, I won't give a precise definition, but wild type is essentially like uh, it includes, you know, problems that have been open for more than 100 years. If you, could, if you can classify the representations of a wild type algebra, you can classify pairs of matrices up to simultaneous conjugation, which is... Uh, does wild just mean not tame? Uh, it does mean not tame, but there, that's, actually a, that's actually a very difficult, important theorem. <laughs> Um, somebody said, I was actually, this is going to come up, work. this is Draw's theorem is, well, so you might imagine that there's, Tame says you admit you get at most one parameter families of indecomposables. You might imagine there's algebras that have one and at most two parameter families of indecomposables. This doesn't actually happen, and this is a theorem. Once you, if there's two parameter family of indecomposables, there's, there exist n parameter families of indecomposables for any n. Um, so it's called the so-called Tame-Wild dichotomy theorem of Draw's. Um, and so, okay, well, so the main thing, let me give it exactly what the algebra of our paper is. This one is going to be of tame type, and I'll say why there's wild ones in a minute. We can take Q to be the quiver that has here, and then we'll say these are like sigma, nu, and rho, and we want to put on the relations that for some sort of commutativity relation, if I loop and then go forwards, that would be nu of sigma. So that should be equal to going forward and looping, which would be rho of nu. And then we have, to make it finite dimensional, we have to have some nilpotence conditions. Here we have rho to the fourth equals sigma to the fourth equals zero. And then we want the image of nu to be in the kernel of rho squared. So that should also equal rho nu. Well, where would you come up with such an algebra? To back to your question, how do you find such a counterexample? This really was a matter of you know, just scouring the, li the literature and like trying to find kind of pathological, <laughs> bizarre algebras and then testing them. And then, like, okay, we were really hoping, I mean, we weren't trying to find a counterexample, we were just trying to prove it in as many special cases as possible and try to patch the techniques together. And this one, it turned out to not have a proof because it was false. <laughs> um, let me say like one sentence about the proof. Uh, this might be two sentences, depending on. Yeah. So I'll say the proof idea. How do you show there's a dense orbit in every component? Well, the first we start out by just like fixing some dimension vectors and doing what you can with explicit matrix methods. You can put, you can assume sigma and rho are in Jordan form. We use explicit matrix methods. 
to reduce the problem. And in fact, you kind of, with enough donkey work, you can basically get something that comes up uh, that ends up being this really difficult looking matrix problem where you have like a matrix and you're allowed all column operations and only some weird subset of row operations. And you have to figure out whether you can put it in normal form. And this is, sounds like you know, a horrible problem to give to some linear algebra class. Um, but it turns out there's a whole school of studying this in the 70s in Ukraine with, with uh, Nazarova and Reuter. And Mark Kleiner actually classified already exactly when you have it in this case for these so-called uh, post-set representation problems. It's a specific kind of matrix problem. Um, and you can translate it into a problem about representations of post-sets. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, it was like 70s. I don't, I'm not sure if it's early or late 70s. I want to say, yeah. So, not much computer help to let me see this post sets of, without getting into all the details of these different things. So it involves a connection to some basically work that was done a long time ago. It was, it was just took several months to recognize the connection. The post sets of finite representation type were classified by Mark Kleiner. In the 70s. And so, well, yeah, to actually demonstrate, to take a given component and really put it, you know, find the dense orbit is, is this kind of long and nasty problem that depends on really a lot of, there's many, many cases and depends on a lot of discrete data. The point is we didn't have to actually solve all those cases. Um, we just had to, like, convert the problem into something that was already solved. Okay, let's see make like a few final, so the point being is then like, well, so the original thing we were trying to prove just ended up being false. But in some sense, this is, this is if you can assign moral values to theorems, it's better that this, that this was false uh, because this ends up opening up a, a, bunch, a whole new class of interesting algebras to study. Um, oh wait, I have to say one or a couple more things. That's gonna be the very last thing I say. Let me just, let me just point it out though. This, this algebra is kind of nasty. Um, and then it has these loops. In general, like, well, when you have these loops, this one's like infinite global dimension, so if you're like doing homological algebra, it's not as nice. Um, we're gonna like try to just, well, what happens when the conjecture's wrong, add a few more hypotheses. Um, we think these loops, without getting into it, like the proof technique and looking, understanding it involved like working in the universal cover and un unwrapping these loops. Uh, we're thinking that possibly, if we just add the hypothesis that the algebra is triangular. In other words, if Q has no oriented cycles, then the associated algebra is DO if and only if finite representation type. In other words, it these, we think that these oriented cycles and the thing wrapping back around on itself plays an essential part in being able to be DO but have infinite representation types. So maybe if that can't happen, then uh, the, our original idea would still hold of characterizing finite representation type in geometric terms. And our progress is like, well, let me just without some array of uh, propositions and limits that have appeared in our paper, state them all at once. This conjecture is true, I already mentioned before, when A has a pre-projective component. Um, it's true for string algebras with like this butterfly quiver, more of a slightly more general class, it's special by serial. So it's true when A is, has a pre-projective component or is special by serial or Let's see what else. Basically, all the places where you have some sort of like explicit techniques, uh, or it's non-distributive, some some kind of algebra where, you, where the ideal lattice is uh, not a distributive lattice. And then um, Birger Huizgen Zimmerman showed me after a talk. She was able to fairly in a fairly straightforward ways show that it's true when the radical squared of A equals zero. In other words, when you declared that every composition of two arrows is zero, then this conjecture was, would hold. Um, 
So we have some progress in special cases, but all these involve sort of like ad hoc methods, and it's a well, we have sort of a program and a strategy but that might to, to still to approach it to approach this revised conjecture, but this would might take another whole talk to go through. So uh, I want to say the last bit of why why I think that's actually in some sense good that it failed. It's actually more interesting, I should say, is that um, Like I said, there's even, we recently found that there's even wild DO algebras, ones that have no hope for classifying, I hate that, I don't like that term, no hope, but they, it would be very, very difficult to classify all indecomposables. decomposables. But to say they have a dense orbit in every component, if you want to think like of the you know, real form of this or something, that's like saying if you choose random matrices, you can only get like finitely many different ones of a given dimension vector. And so there is some hope for classifying generic representations. So we recently found wild DO algebras. So these, in principle, we can classify their generic representations, at least. We could Give some nice listing of what modules you're like to get likely to get if you took random matrices with probability one. Right? Yeah, except that the ones you pick in general are usually special in some way, so they're not I mean, <laughs> generic. I mean, seriously, I mean, it's like almost all numbers are transcendental. Well, quick, how many? So this kind of goes back to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, this kind of goes back to this like this That's kind of a theory. You also see it in modular represent modular representations of finite groups like, well, if we can't classify it, let's define a new representation theoretic problem that we can solve. And uh, let's classify, so one of the specific ones, um, let's try to classify a certain kinds of representations. And even this, so, but, well, what does this amount to? This is by finding all indecomposable, irreducible components. And this goes back to something that's like, In general, a difficult problem. There's no general techniques for finding irreducible components of these module varieties. Uh, but at least in principle, it's done. And I'll say that um, I can't quite say like theorem yet, but I feel like we're basically, uh, I'll say we have a good idea. <laughs> Details pending of the classification for the origin, for the example of the theorem before. One with the two loops. The dumbbell quiver. The dumbbell quiver, exactly. That's a good one. Uh, we've got a classification in our given example before and an entire family that it fits in. So, in fact, you can increase the degree of nil potency at the, uh, you can increase the degree of nil potency of the loops and you actually get more complicated algebras in some sense. They go from tame to wild, but the same classification of irreducible components will work. And so I think that shows like to really, so for me to maybe convince you that generic representation theory is interesting and poses something that like takes a previously unsolvable problem and gives an aspect of it that can be solved. This is like the first main goal to like actually give an example where this is, this gets done. Um, and then like in the last minute I'll say there's, uh, we got about 12, 12 minutes. Okay. Sorry. I have two. Okay. Then I'll actually, like two minutes late. that's true. All right. Um, then I'll write down the last two things I want to say is then, okay, so I've, I've tried to argue that this generic represent, this dense orbit property is interesting and it leads to an interesting class of algebras that have been, been overlooked, really not studied by anyone before, but might have interesting representation theory and not be, not be hopeless to say something about. Well, this dense orbit property, I think, is really actually just like kind of, you, it could be thought of as like the, possibly the tip of an iceberg where there's a lot, a lot, of, a lot of work to be done to find out. We could also, um, exactly, in a given irreducible component of now any module variety, in an irreducible component 
there's a well-defined notion of the number of parameters needed to describe the generic representation. This follows like from, from Rosenlicht's theorem. Uh, this is like used by used by Katz and maybe even people before him. number of parameters needed to describe a generic representation. In other words, like Rosenlich's theorem says you have an open subset where your, where your group acts, fr uh, acts freely and you can take a nice geometric quotient and then whatever the dimension of that geometric quotient is, is like the number of parameters you need to describe the family of representations. Um, so what is DO? DO would be where every irreducible component is, uh, has zero generic parameters. And okay, you could then move up and say, we could call an algebra generically tame. If, um, well, same thing as the tame from before, but now we, we only require it to hold generically. You can, all, you can throw away some closed subset, you get some sort of boundary uh, of, your, of every component and only study the modules in that. So we call it generically tame. If um, uh, every component C admits at most, one parameter families of generic representations, uh, indecomposable representations. Uh, okay, so I can surely make this definition, but we don't have any example of such thing. Same thing back to DO. Okay, well, an algebra that's actually tame is just by a priori generically tame, but are there non-trivial examples? So that would be a question or an open problem or something. Are there wild but generically tame algebras? That's kind of the next kind of a refinement, I guess. Uh, so I have no idea. We haven't even thought about it. I think it's the next natural step. If so, um, this would be like a cool thing to look at and a nice, a nice generalization of what we've done. And then, yeah, let me throw one more, one more question out there. But I maybe need, I don't think I can fit it over here. Uh, so I would call this like, is there a generic draws to theorem or generic tame wild dichotomy? So it's like the behavior I explained earlier was that if you have an algebra and there's one parameter families of indecomposables, that's okay. Then, it, but once you hit two parameter families, you get arbitrarily in in, in parameter families in some different uh, vector spaces. Does this happen generically? If you can find a component where there's uh, generically a two parameter family, can you also find a component where there's three, four, five, six higher parameter families? Um, no clue, but I think it would be interesting questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Are there questions, comments, complaints? Counterexamples. Yeah, counter examples. I, I have a couple of questions or comments, but Great. maybe somebody else does. You guys good? Jason, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, let me wait. I'll try to ask you a question. So the, the paper the you guys were the main results are the two examples or the, the one? Uh, the example. main results were the, the dumbbell yeah. Example. Oh, yeah, the dumbbell and the butterfly example, but then also the, the special cases where we like right. prove that they prop, the characterize the problem. The, the yeah, I would say though, yeah. I would agree. Did you call them examples or counterexamples? I think I called them counterexamples. Well, yeah, Counterexample to a question that's being been asked so for a while. Can, you, can undergrads do, like, can you do computer research on this? Um, probably undergrads that know how to use computers better than me. Yes. Are there quiver 
Are there Quiver software packages? There are, there are. And you do they help like, at all? Not the right in Quiver, I think there's a computer package. But I don't think it would help here. Um, because these are the classified components, you know. Right. So, so I mean, for to classify. Undergrads could help, like, I don't know, you reduce problems to matrix problems, like you were saying, you reduced it to problems from a long time ago, meaning the set is yeah. for you. Um, <laughs> I would say in principle, yes, but it might be, uh, in principle, yes, but it, in practice, it, well, it, the problem, would ha I don't, I don't know exactly what problems would be appropriate to give out quite yet, because yeah. some of them could just be like a rabbit hole that just, uh, well, that's what research is, <laughs> you should learn that. Oh, okay, yeah, fair enough, then, then yes, <laughs> I would, I would immediately have them looking for a uh, wild, but you know, you would do the same, exact same thing we did, pick some small things that just only have two dots and a few arrows, that means you're working with the most three matrices at a time, and you start putting, trying to put things in normal form and see how many parameters you find. And right. Writing a proof at the end is the hard part, but certainly someone with just knowledge of linear algebra and base change could start exploring examples. Cool. Other questions? Jerzy? No, not to add, we, 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 we try to do Macaulay tool to do some more. Yeah. Example, but you see this arbitrary dimension vector, so even if you have two arms or something like that, three vertices, if your imaginary vector goes up a little bit, it's just... Yeah, you think it depends on... The amount of RAM we have these days, it's still I mean, they're sort of like quadratic in the in the, your dimensions, and so... Yeah. yeah. They, and so quickly, you get over 20, even some what would be almost trivial examples by hand have over 20 variables, and call at least on my laptop, my colleague gets angry when I put over 10 or 15 variables. <laughs> That's nice. It's nice that they're still simple-looking problems. That yeah. <laughs> Don't avail themselves of such attacks. Any other comments, questions? All right, well, let's thank Ryan again.